was something else as well that, that guests of the resort did not get, but only owners got. We had a car and a driver that was provided for us if we needed to run down the street and, and get some food. And so the amazing thing about that is really not anything about us. The amazing thing about that is we were given the rights and privileges of, of being an owner. And it was because of the relationship that we had with that couple. Because of the relationship that we had with them, we had special rights and privileges that were being given to us. And there was no other reason in the world why we would get those privileges. The passage that we just read starts with Jesus telling a parable. And he's teaching them something with the parable. He's telling, he's, his, he's telling his disciples, here's what you pray, and we've talked about that. We've gone through that for weeks. But now I'm going to tell you how to approach your Father in heaven. Because the reality is, as God's children, as people who have the right and privilege to call him Father, we now have the right and privilege to come before him and ask him for exactly what we need. And the way that we approach God, the way that we, we come to him in prayer, we come before the face of God, before the presence of God, is we come with humility. We come by faith. We come continually. And we come confidently. So what Jesus is teaching us is how do we approach God in prayer? How do we come before the throne of God, before the presence of God, and ask him for what we need. And the first thing we do is we ask him for what we need with humility. If you look at the parable, Jesus tells his disciples, if any of you has a friend, who would go to him at midnight? Who would go to him and ask for three loaves of bread at midnight when everyone's asleep, even though you have a guest that's come into your home, even though you've had this person come from a journey who you didn't really expect, who of you has a friend who would actually do that? Who would actually go to that person and say, lend me three loaves. I know it's midnight. I know it's late. I know that your whole family is asleep because we know from, from Jewish history that that particular home most likely was one room. And the family was sleeping in one room. And so if anybody knocks on that door, it's going to wake the whole house. If anyone, if, if the dad gets up and walks to the door and opens the door and unlocks the door, it's going to make so much noise that it's going to wake the whole house up. But he does it anyway. He goes to his neighbor because, again, in Jewish history, hospitality, treating someone well, treating a guest well, was so important in that culture. A guest was welcomed and cared for regardless of the amount of time, or regardless of the time that they came, they came and regardless of whether or not they're expected or not. So this man has to go to his neighbor late at night, most likely going to wake up the whole house, because he's had someone show up at his house from out of town, and he, he wants to give him some bread. He wants to care for him well. But he goes before his neighbor, and he says these words, I have nothing to set before my guest. He walks over to his neighbor. He knocks on the door, and he says, you've got to give me something. You've got to give me what I need, because I have nothing to give this man. As you and I come to God as his children, we come with humility as his children who have nothing to offer. The problems that we face, the challenges that we face, you and I as God's children, we must come with humility because we don't have the answer to every problem. We don't have the resources to fix every issue 
that, that's going on in our families, that's going on in the world around us. We simply don't have it. We have to come to our Father in heaven and know that it's okay to say to him, I have nothing. It takes a heart of humility to come before someone and say, I have this problem. I don't know how to solve it. And I need your help. It takes a heart of humility to do that. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7 says this, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you or lift you up, casting your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Asking for what we need involves coming to God with a heart of humility, knowing this, that he does know what the problem is. He does have the resources to solve it. But you and I have to come handing over that problem to him. We have to come handing over that problem to him, su submitting to him humbly and saying, I don't have the answer, so I'm going to give this over to you. Here, here's the issue I have with my, my child. Here's the issue that I have that's going on in my marriage. Here's the issues that are going on in my job. I don't have the solution. I don't have the, the ability to fix it. God, I've got to give it over to you. In early 2019, my wife and I found out that one of our daughters had an eating disorder. And come to find out, we found out pretty late in the process that she had an eating disorder. And the eating disorder is extremely complicated. And they have specialized counselors that you, you can't go to just any counselor. This person has to be trained in eating disorders. And so we found ourselves not really understanding what the eating disorder is and what it really meant for our, for our child, what it meant for us as, as her parents. The only thing that we knew for certain was that we did not have the answers. We did not know the solution. There was nothing that we could do. The only thing that we could do was hand her over to the Lord and come to him and say, God, we don't know how to get past this, but we know that she's yours. And so we're going to ask you to help her. We're going to ask you to work through her counselors to bring her to a place where she can get better. And today, she is so much better, and we praise the Lord for it. If you are one of God's children, if you have put your faith and trust in him, you have, been, you have been given the right and the privilege to come to him as your father, asking for what you need, and we come to him with humility. But there's also another part to that, is we come by faith. And there's two areas that I'm really focused on as we come to our Father asking for what we need by faith. And it's, it's these two areas. It's according to his will and with our whole hearts. The man in the story that, that Jesus is telling, he, he takes the initiative, he goes to the neighbor, and he chooses one specific neighbor to go to. And he's going to ask that neighbor, hey, I need, I need these three loaves. This man has come. He's traveled far. I want to take good care of him. The man who goes to his neighbor goes believing this is going to happen. This is actually going to happen. He's going to give me what I need because ultimately I know, I know my neighbor. He's going to provide what I need. In John 15, 7, Jesus says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. There's two conditions that are so important so that we don't see God as just something, our magic eight ball, who we can ask whatever we want from. The first condition is this, when he says, when we abide 
in him, when we abide in Jesus, what that means is we are united to him in faith. We have trusted him by faith. We are united to Jesus Christ by faith like, like a branch is connected to a vine. You are one. So the first condition is, if you abide in me, and then the second one is, if my words abide in you. And Jesus is saying, if my words abide in you, what that means is simply this. If, your wor- if his words are abiding in you, it is going to impact the thoughts you have, the desires you have, the things you ask for. And what he's saying is, if, that, if those two conditions are true, look, you are going to be desiring more and more to ask me for what you need, but to ask me according to my will. Because as you and I become closer, as this relationship becomes more intimate, as you and I become more connected in our relationship with each other, your desires are going to change. Your desires are going to be more in line with my desires for you. R.C. Sproul wrote on praying uh, a prayer of faith. And he says this, Our struggle with praying for what God promises is not with our wrestling to ask him to give us what we desire, but our wrestling with his word until we are illuminated and subdued, saying, not my will, but your will be done. We pray, we come to God praying as his child, praying by faith, but also praying according to his will. May his will be done and not ours. Because we can't see as God sees. We don't know the why to every circumstance that we're going through. And so we pray, God, this is what I need, but not my will be done, but your will be done. Praying by faith also means that we pray with our whole hearts. This man who who went to his neighbor, his heart, his mind, his, his actions were set on one purpose, and it was being able to provide bread for this visitor. The idea of praying and seeking God with our whole hearts means that we're seeking him with our mind, with our will, with our desires, with our emotions. Psalm 119.10 says, with my whole heart, I seek you. Again, it's, it's in my mind, it's my thinking it's my doing, it's my motives, it's my emotions, it's, it's everything about me. I am seeking the Lord in prayer. And it is encompassing all that I am and all that I have to go to him and seek him with my whole heart. About 15 years ago, uh, the church that we were at had a, had a family camp. And so we went to this family camp over the Labor Day weekend, and there were, um, it was lots of families, and it was, it was super fun, and, but one of the things that the guys did was we decided we were going to play football. And so we played football in about a 50-yard size uh, field of grass, and we had a great time. Nobody got injured, which was a miracle, and so at the end of it, we knew, okay, it's time to go back to camp, it's time to go back and... And, you know, go to the kind of the next thing of activities that we had to do with our families and that we were um, doing with everybody in the camp. One man raised his hand and said, stop, we can't go yet. He looked at everybody and he said, my wedding ring is somewhere in this 50 yards of grass. And so immediately, one of the leaders got the, the 15 men that were there And we spread all the way across the the field. And we started walking step by step, just in lockstep. Step by step, our eyes were on the ground in front of us. Our, our, Our direction was going from one end of the field to the other. And within about 10 minutes, the ring was found. But in that moment, Our eyes, everything that we're thinking about, everything we're thinking about in our mind is about finding this ring. Everything our eyes are looking at, 
are focused on the ground searching for that ring. The, the way our bodies are shifted, we're going in one direction together looking for this ring. That's what it means to seek God wholeheartedly. Every part of you, your mind, your thinking, your, the focus of, of your eyes, the focus of the direction that you're walking, the direction that you're living your life is seeking God with your whole heart in prayer. Seeking God with our whole hearts in prayer, it is a privilege that we have to do that because it's in him that we have unlimited resources. It's in him that we have the only one who understands what we're going through, why we're going through it, and what is the end goal. He knows all of that. And so when we seek him in prayer, when we go to our Father in heaven asking for what we need, seeking him with all our whole hearts, we are coming to the very one who knows exactly what the goal is. He knows the purpose that he has for us. And so we come before our Father in heaven asking for what we need with humility, by faith, but we also come continually. If you look back at the verses that we read, in verse 8, you're going to see this word impudence. I'm not even sure I'm pronouncing it correctly, but that's what the little voice on Google told me. So impudence is what we went with. So, the, But more importantly, the ESV renders that word persistence. The NIV calls it shameless audacity. The Greek actually is a type of shameless boldness. In other words, this man in this parable is coming, is coming shamelessly and boldly to his neighbor, regardless of what time it is, regardless of whether or not he's going to wake up the entire family. He's coming for one reason. He's coming to ask for what he needs. And he comes shamelessly and boldly. But then in verse 9, verse 9, the Greek verbs for ask and seek and knock, they actually can be translated like this, keep seeking, keep knocking, keep asking. In other words, keep coming to God in humility, asking him for what you need. Keep seeking God with your whole heart by pursuing his desires and his purposes for your life rather than what you think you need. Keep knocking, keep persisting boldly in prayer because we know that he will fulfill the purpose that he has for you. We all know Romans 8, 28, where Paul says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those that are called according to his purpose. We keep asking, we keep seeking we keep knocking because we know that God is at work in our lives and in the world around us. And I love this other verse that I have to include, which is Paul, again, speaking in 1 Thessalonians 5.16, where he says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances. And we know there, we know from that verse that what, what Paul is actually speaking about is having this attitude of prayerfulness. As you come to your Father in heaven, we're to have this attitude of prayerfulness. It means like as you go to work, as you walk from the parking lot into the door of, your, of wherever you work, as you, as you go throughout the grocery store, as you go throughout your day, have this attitude of prayerfulness throughout your day. Coming continually to your Father in heaven and asking for what you need. So the question, one question I have for you is, do you come to your Father in heaven with bold and specific requests? Do you bring them before the Lord continually? I know many, many people I've heard pray, pray this way. Father, lead, guide, and direct me. And I think that's a good prayer, but I think we should go further with that. I think we should get bold and specific. 
What do you want him to lead you to do? What do you want him to guide you to do? How do you want him to direct you? We can pray like this, Father, lead me to two individuals this week that I can share my faith with. Father, guide me in the conversations I have this week and and the, and the scheduling that I do this week to not schedule my week so full of everything that I simply forget about you. And then direct me. Father, direct every step that I take that I would be present in every moment and not constantly looking forward to what is next. Be bold. Be specific with your prayers. Because we have the right and the privilege as God's children because of the relationship that we have with our Father in Heaven to come to Him approaching the throne of God, the face of God with what we are asking for. And we do it humbly, we do it by faith, we do it continually, and lastly, we come to him confidently. And I love this last point because it, verse 9 starts with these words. I tell you, that is Jesus speaking, and we need to, we need to our ears need to pop open when we hear those words coming from the mouth of Jesus. I tell you. What is he telling us? He's telling us whoever asks, they will receive. Whoever seeks will find. Whoever knocks, it will be opened to you. Now he's not promising to be our genie in the sky. He's not promising to just give us whatever we ask for and regardless of, of what his purposes is. And we've talked about that. But here's what he is promising. He is promising to hear our prayers, and he's promising to answer them. He's promising to hear them, and he's promising to answer them. The God of the universe has promised in his word, in this moment, when you pray to me, when you ask me for what you need, I will hear you, and I'm going to answer you. I love the story of Jonah. Many of you know the story of Jonah. Jonah was, uh, was a prophet. He was told specifically by God to go to Nineveh, to call out to the Ninevites, to call them to repent and turn from sin. And Jonah did not like that. Jonah decided, no, God, I'm not going to do that. So he goes the complete opposite way. He gets on a ship. He goes the opposite way. And there's a big storm on the sea. And the ship is in trouble. The men on the ship, they don't know what to do. So they take Jonah and they throw him in the water. And the water becomes calm. And in the process, Jonah, who's, who's, who's drowning, is swallowed by a fish. And as he's in that fish, as he's in that place, he prays to the Lord. And we have it recorded in Jonah chapter 2. He says these words, I called out to the Lord. Out of my distress, he answered me. And he says, you heard my voice. God heard his prayers. And God spared his life. But God did not leave him on the path that he wanted to stay on. Why? Because it's what, it wasn't God's purpose for his life. The answer of God came. And the answer of God says, I will save you. I've heard you. I am going to save you. But you're still going to go to Nineveh. We can't know exactly how God is going to answer our prayers. But we can know this. We can know that he, he hears us and he will answer our prayers. And because we know that we serve a righteous and good God, we can know that the way he answers will be for his glory and ultimately our good. One commentator says this, God is ready and willing to respond to us. We just need to ask, seek, and knock. These promises, ask and you will receive, seek and you will find, knock 
and it will be open to you are promises that our requests for spiritual welfare will be heard. And I love that quote because unlike the neighbor, when you and I come to our Father in heaven and we come asking for what we need, we come to him with humility, we come to him by faith, we come to him continually, and we come to him confidently, here's what's not going to happen. God is not going to be bothered by you continually coming to him. God is not going to look at you and say, I'm sorry, this is not a convenient time. Could you come back at another time? God is not going to look at you and say, you know what? Man, I haven't heard from you in a while, so I think we just need to hold on this request. And he's not going to come and say, I told you so. Our Father in heaven is, is waiting to hear from you. He's ready and willing to hear and answer your prayers according to his will for our good and for his glory. And we can confidently come to him because of that. But we can also confidently come to our Father in heaven because of who he is and how much he loves us. And here's the part about this parable that's actually going through not just verses 5 through 10, but the verses that, that Martin will preach next week through verse 13, and it's this. When Jesus tells this parable, he's using an argument. And the argument is called a lesser to greater argument. And here's what, here's what the, the argument is. Look, if, if your neighbor who is bothered, irritated, and inconvenienced will give you exactly what you need, how much more will your Father in heaven, who loves you, his, who sent his son to die for you, how much more would he not give you what you ask for? The same argument is in Matthew 6, verses 28 through 30, when Jesus is speaking on being anxious about what we wear. He says this, why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not more clothe you? Consider the lilies. If he's willing to do that for the flowers of the field, how much more would he be willing to do for you, the one who he calls his sons and his daughters. We have been given the right and the privilege to come to him asking for what we need. And we come with humility. We come by faith, we come continually, and we come confidently because of who he is and how much he loves us. There's a movie that I know all, you, all of you are familiar with. It's also a book, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And in this book, in this movie, there is this mysterious wardrobe that when someone opens up the doors, the wardrobe parts, and someone is granted access into Narnia. But if that wardrobe doesn't part, then that person cannot get to Narnia. In other words... There's a barrier between where that person wants to be and where that, where that person needs to be. There's a barrier there. If you look back at, at Jewish history and you go back and you look at the house of worship, there was a veil or a curtain. And it was between a place called the holy place and the most holy place. And in that most holy place was where the presence of God resided. And only one person could go into that place between past that veil, past that curtain, once a year, and it was the most high priest. When Jesus Christ, the Son of God, stepped onto this earth, when he humbled himself and took on the form of a servant, 
and he became the likeness of man, he humbled himself. But he further humbled himself when he made himself obedient to death and obedient to death on a cross. And when he did, he placed himself on the altar. Not the blood of a goat, not the blood of, of a lamb. He placed himself on that altar. And he became the sacrifice for our sins. Our sinless Savior became the sacrifice for your sin and my sin. And when he died, that veil tore in two. That veil was completely torn in two. And what that meant for you and me is there was no longer a barrier between the people of God and the presence of God. There was no longer a barrier. We no longer needed a priest to pray for us because we could come before the throne of God, before the presence of God, and approach him because of the Son of God and the sacrifice that he made. And so we come boldly before our Father in heaven because the Son was crucified for us. And we can come into his presence asking for what we need because we come humbly, we come by faith, we come continually, and we come confidently. But remember, this is about a relationship. The disciples are being taught. So the question is, well, what about you all who, who don't know Christ? You've never trusted Christ as your Savior. Well, the truth still stands. God, through his Son, stands ready and willing to hear and answer your prayer. Your bold prayers. But your bold prayers may be this. God, cleanse me of my sin and forgive me. Give me a new heart. Help me to believe in you and to trust in you by faith today. That is your prayer if you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. That's your prayer today. So let us come to the Lord praying boldly, specifically, because of who he is and how much he loves us. And I pray that today will be the day of salvation for many of you in this room. And, and maybe for some of you, you've known Christ forever, but you're distant. My prayer for you is that today would be a day of spiritual renewal for you. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.